The talk I've prepared, entitled PC-150, Confederation and the Railway, How Ladysmith Ties into the Tricky Tale of the e &M, examines the circumstances and terms under which BC joined the Canadian Confederation on July 20th, 1871, within which the promise of construction of a transcontinental railway connecting an isolated British Columbia to Eastern Canada was a pivotal factor. How we ended up with the current Southern BC Railway Network is reviewed, and the progress of construction of the ENN Railway on Vancouver Island is followed through extensive reference to newspapers of the day. The railway was built over difficult terrain in a very short time, this project being typical of the enormous energy being demonstrated in colonial expansion in Canada during the late 19th century. The town of Ladysmith did not exist at the time of construction of the core ENN railway, which took place between 1883 and 1886. Ladysmith wasn't established till 1900. Yet I argue that the later choice of location of the town was closely related to use of the area's wonderful natural harbor, Oyster Bay Harbor, for the ENN construction purposes. Main points of this talk to take away. <clears throat> The promise of a transcontinental Canadian Pacific Railway was fundamental to BC joining the Canadian Confederation. And you will see that this promise was prompted by the threat of American influence in the Pacific Northwest. Esquimalt on Vancouver Island was originally designated the Pacific terminus of the Canadian Pacific Railway. We'll see why it didn't end up so, and why it didn't is a very tricky tale. The Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway was in effect a consolation to Vancouver Island for the terminus finally being chosen at Burrard Inlet. And that decision subsequently led to the growth of Vancouver and the development of the Lower Mainland. Oyster Bay, now Ladysmith Harbor, played a central role during construction of the northern part of the ENN Railway. It was the site of the first landing of rail and locomotive for the entire ENN railway and was where the first rail was laid on the main ENN line. And as I mentioned before, I propose a thesis that the use of Oyster Bay Harbor for construction of the ENN railway likely contributed to its later choice by Dunsmuir for shipping coal from his coal mines and ultimately ended up in the choice of the location of the town of Ladysmith. Let's start our story with um, <clears throat> before the colonists got here. This map shows Pacific Northwest nations traditional territories. Our talk today is being given from the unceded territory, traditional territory of the Salinas First Nation, a Coast Salish First Nation and their traditional territories are located mainly here on Southeast Vancouver Island, as shown by this red rectangle. We'll also see that First Nations territories and rights were completely ignored by a government during the time of colonial expansion, which forms the focus of this presentation. Let's look at how British Columbia came to be. <clears throat> This is a map showing the earliest colonial imprint. British influence was first really manifest uh, in founding of the colony of Vancouver Island in 1849. And this was uh, as a result of the Hudson Bay Company setting up a fur trading fort at Victoria. It was followed by creation of a Lieutenant Dependency of the Queen Charlotte Islands in 1852. And then the colony of British Columbia on the mainland in 1858. The final piece of British Columbia that we know today was added in 1863. It's interesting to note that apart from the colony of Vancouver Island, which was founded as a fur trading colony, the other three colonies were founded in response to uh, influx of uh, foreigners onto British, in, British uh, soil, so to speak, um, by the crown. They wanted to uh, basically exert the crown's influence in the area and make sure that uh, 
the area didn't become basically um, uh, managed by foreign interests. We see in the Queen Charlotte's Gold Rush in 1852, the Fraser River Gold Rush in 1858, and the Caribou Gold Rush in 1863. British Columbia takes its current shape uh, in 1866 with the formation of the United Colony of British Columbia. The four uh, crown colonies that we saw before were all combined into one United Colony in 1866. It's important to understand that the, pop the settler population in British Columbia was very small, probably around 10,000, and was focused on Vancouver Island, and the center of government was in Victoria. Esquimalt was a, a major um, British uh, Pacific naval port, and Nanaimo was producing coal at that time. 1867 saw four Eastern provinces unite to form the, the Canadian Confederation, those provinces being Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. At that time, a year after the formation of the United Colony of British Columbia, we saw an isolated British Columbia, which was broke and in depression, separated from the Canadian Dominion by a very large expanse of land, which was under the handle of the Hudson Bay Company. Let's look at what was happening in the rest of the North American continent. The US Civil War took place between 1861 to 1865. And even before the end of the Civil War, the North or the Union was expanding westward and uh, between 1863 and 1869 constructed the Central Pacific Union Pacific Railroad, which connected the Eastern Rail Network from St. Louis to San Francisco. In 1869, there were American plans afoot to build a more northerly railroad called the Northern Pacific Railroad, shown in red on this map. It's interesting to uh, get an insight into the strategic thinking that was happening in Washington. This uh, Pacific Railroads report dating from February 1869 um, outlines quite clearly what the Americans were thinking. The line of the North Pacific Road runs for 1500 miles near the British possessions. And when built, will drain the agricultural products of the rich Saskatchewan and Red River districts east of the mountains and the gold country of the Fraser, Thompson and Kootenai rivers west of the mountains. There was also some comments about trade um, <clears throat> from China, Canton to Liverpool. It's 1500 miles nearer by the 49th parallel of latitude than by way of San Francisco and New York. In other words, the existing railroad that the Americans had at their disposal. This advantage, the uh, 49th parallel advantage, in securing the overland trade from Asia will not be thrown away by the English unless it is taken away by our first building, the North Pacific Road. The report ends up by stating, the opening by us first of a North Pacific Railroad seals the destiny of the British possessions west of the 91st Meridian. They will become so Americanized in interests and feeling that they will in effect be severed from the new dominion and the question of their annexation will be but a question of time. So basically what the Americans were saying is all the British possessions west of the 91st Meridian would be drained by this Northern Pacific Railroad. And this area here in uh, British North America would basically cede to the, the United States. Don't forget that in 1867, the Americans had just purchased Alaska from Russia. And so they were obviously considering a territorial home run all the way up the Pacific Northwest coast. The Canadian Dominion was not blind to this, and we saw considerable movement to um, basically establish a political connection all the way across the continent within the British possessions. We had seen the four Eastern provinces 
joining together to form the first uh, iteration of the Canadian Dominion. Then in 1870, through negotiations with the Hudson's Bay Company, Manitoba, Rupert's Land, and the Northwest Territory were added to the Dominion. And then British Columbia in 1871. And with the addition of British Columbia, uh, there was a complete uh, political connection from coast to coast. Sir John A. Macdonald, Canada's first prime minister and one of the fathers of Canadian Confederation was a main driver in this political initiative. And he was a main proponent of the, what was called a Canadian Pacific Railway. He recognized that a railway in competition with the American railway would basically be a tie that bound the dominion. It's interesting to see that by 1885, not too long afterwards, 15 years after we were talking about earlier, there were four transcontinental railroads in the United States. So a massive proliferation of transcontinental railroads. The Dominion government, even prior to uh, completion of negotiations with British Columbia with regards to British Columbia joining the Canadian Confederation had dispatched their uh, chief surveyor, Sanford Fleming, um, out west to begin surveying for the Pacific Railway. This is an article from the Daily British Colonist uh, of Victoria, what, dated Wednesday, June the 7th, 1871. And it notes that Mr. Sanford Fleming with a party of surveyors is now on the way to this city, i.e. Victoria, to commence the survey of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Mr. Fleming will explore in person from Vancouver Island to Fort Garry at once in order to give preliminary information to enable the Dominion government to give the contracts, in other words, for construction with as little delay as possible. Then in July, 1871, we saw British Columbia sign uh, terms of union and join the Canadian Confederation. Article 11 of the terms of union is of political, a, a particular importance to us in this talk. And it reads in part, the government of the dominion undertake to secure the commencement simultaneously within two years from the date of the union of the construction of a railway from the Pacific toward the Rocky Mountains and from such point as may be selected east of the Rocky Mountains toward the Pacific to connect the seaboard of British Columbia with the railway system of Canada and further to secure the completion of such railway within 10 years from the date of union. In other words, the Dominion government undertook to start building a Pacific railway connecting East and Western Canada within two years of British Columbia signing the terms of union and to finish that uh, railway within 10 years. The, Brit the government of British Columbia on its side agreed to convey to the Dominion government in trust to be appropriated in such manner as the Dominion government may deem advisable in furtherance of the construction of the said railway. A similar extent of public lands along the line of railway throughout its entire length in British Columbia. This uh, band of land not to exceed, however, 20 miles on either side of the railway line. Now this band of land, it's important, um, was basically considered as the way that the government would end up paying the company, whichever company it was chosen to construct the railway line. In British Columbia, the terms of the union were very favorably received and in fact went way beyond even their most optimistic expectations. However, in Ottawa, there was a mixed reaction with significant political div division. There was a lot of concern about cost and taxpayer burden with regards to paying for construction of the Trans-Canada, in other words, Pacific Railway. It was estimated that the initial outlay would be $100 million of the day, i.e. over 2.2 billion of our today's dollars, followed by 8 million annually for the 10 years of construction or $180 million per year for 10 years. So in total, the whole uh, railway was perceived at costing in roughly $4 billion of today's dollars. 
It must be remembered that the estimated population of Canada in 1871 was 3.6 million, and that include First Nations. So there was a fairly small taxpayer pool to pay this massive cost. It was also recognized that the population of British Columbia in 1871 was approximately 11,000 immigrants and the First Nations, and uh, that there was relatively few people in British Columbia uh, against which such an expenditure could be justified. But the government wanted to build this as it saw as the tie that bound the Dominion together. In 1872, um, the question of the, where the Western terminus was going to be was um, spoken about by Hector Longevin, member of the Conservative government at Ottawa. And he acknowledged that the Northern Pacific Railway, in other words, the American Railway, ended at Puget Sound. And the competition which that line will make with the Canadian Pacific Railway renders it desirable to select a terminus for the Canadian Pacific Railway that will put us in the best possible position for competition with American railways. If it should be decided that we can cross Seymour Narrows or Johnson Straits with a railway train, there can be no doubt that the interests of British Columbia and the Dominion as a whole will be better served by adopting that route. That route being essentially an extension of a railway line from the Caribou to the head of Butte Inlet, which had been proposed by a man called Alfred Waddington in the 1860s to connect the Caribou to the, to, to the ocean. It was proposed that that line would be continued down Butte Inlet and then across Seymour Narrows to Vancouver Island near Campbell River. In other words, it would cross down Butte Inlet across the islands here onto Vancouver Island, just north of Campbell River, and then proceed down the East Coast, down to Esquimalt. Esquimalt was proposed as the terminus because it was the best port closest to the Asian trade, and as such represented an advantage to the uh, American end line ending at Puget Sound. So, the government had basically considered, we'll put it, put the terminus, or one of them, the most favorable terminus they were talking about was Esquimalt. So who would build the Canadian Pacific Railway? There were two groups competing for the contract, the Canada Pacific Railway Company and the Interoceanic Railway Company. In February, 1873, the Canada Pacific Railway Company was chartered by the conservative government to build the railway. However, everything blew up two months later when a liberal member of parliament announced that he had uncovered evidence of bribery in that the Canadian Pacific Railway Company had been granted the contract in return for political donations of $360,000 to the conservatives in the lead up to the 1872 general election. And this was what was called the Pacific Scandal. Macdonald, the Conservative Prime Minister, tried to continue in the face of this scandal. And on June the 7th, 1873, his government announced by order in council that Esquimalt in Vancouver Island be fixed as the terminus of the Canadian Pacific Railway and that a line of railway be located between the harbour of Esquimalt and Seymour Narrows on the said island. And he sent surveyors out to mark the exact location of the terminus. While this was going on, however, in light of the Pacific scandal, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company failed to obtain sufficient funding and had to relinquish its charter to build the railway. This slide shows a gentleman called Marcus Smith on the left, who was chief assistant engineer of the Canadian Pacific Railway. And he was in charge of all the surveys for the Western Division, about a thousand miles in length, extending from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast. It was this gentleman that was sent to Esquimalt to, to locate the terminus of the Pacific Railway. The article on the right from the Daily British Colonist, a Victoria newspaper, dated 20th July 1873, states, 
the terminus of the Canadian Pacific Railway Company was located yesterday. And then it goes on to give some detail about where it was in Esquimalt. The terminus is on the Indian Reserve. And the Indian Reserve uh, was a tract of land adjacent to um, Esquimalt Harbor. It is supposed that the company will take the Indian Reserve and that the lands in another part of the harbor will be allotted to the Indians. So you can see that the Indians were being pushed aside in favor of the terminus of the Pacific Railway. The last part of the article notes that a telegram was received from Ottawa in the morning that the commencement of the location survey on or before 20th of July is considered as keeping with terms of the Treaty of the Union. You may remember when we were talking about the terms of the Union between British Columbia and Canadian Dominion, that uh, the construction of the railway was to start within two years of BC signing the terms of the Union. Well, 20th of July, 1873 is two years to the day that BC joined the, uh, the Dominion. There was a lot of skepticism about this and it was pretty obvious that the conservative government had sent Marcus Smith out there um, in a uh, sort of shallow uh, attempt to um, comply with the first terms of BC joining the Canadian Confederation. Amor de Cosmos, a particularly interesting character whose real name was William Alexander Smith, who was the Liberal MP for Victoria between 1871 and 1882, and the second Premier of BC between 1872 and 1874, called this uh, establishment of the um, railway at Esquimalt uh, by Marcus Smith as a disreputable farce. He saw no way that construction would actually start at that particular time. Remember that the Pacific scandal was still raging. In November 1873, uh, John A. Macdonald, the Conservative Prime Minister, had to resign. In the subsequent general election, he was voted out of office. But during the campaign for that election, Alexander Mackenzie, the Liberal leader, denounced Macdonald's railway policy and the promises that had been made by the Dominion to Vancouver Island. In February 1874, Alexander Mackenzie, Liberal Prime Minister, took office on a platform of fiscal restraint. This quote from Mackenzie outlines his government's stance with regards to the railway and the terms under which BC joined the Union. We must meet the difficulties imposed upon Canada by the reckless arrangements of the late government with reference to the Pacific Railway. And the bargain is, as we have always said it was, incapable of literal fulfillment. We must therefore endeavor to arrange with British Columbia for a relaxation of its terms. A little later in 1876, a Liberal Government Privy Council report enunciated succinctly the prior Conservative Party position and where it had left the Liberals. By this policy, had it remained unreserved, the Liberal government would have been obliged by the previous Conservative government to provide construction of over 160 miles of railway on Vancouver Island at a probable cost of over $7,500,000, beside the building of a railway from the head of Butte Inlet and the bridging of the Narrows, a work supposed to be the most gigantic of its kind ever suggested and estimated to cost over $27 million and a half dollars. So not a lot of support for a railway on Vancouver Island by the Liberals. Mackenzie sent J. Edgar to Victoria to renegotiate with the British Columbia government. However, those talks came to naught and there was considerable acrimony which led to British Columbia appealing to London for redress, complaining that the Dominion was not living up to the terms of BC joining uh, the Union. The colonial secretary in Britain, Lord Carnarvon, offered to arbitrate and he was accepted. And he recommended the following. Construction of a railway from Esquimalt to Nanaimo be commenced as soon as possible. 
mainland railway surveys be pushed on with utmost vigor, a transcontinental wagon road and telegraph line be constructed immediately, and $2 million be minimum annual expenditure on the Pacific Railway within British Columbia to be spent once surveying had sufficiently identified the line of rail. He also reset that the railway was to be completed on or before the 30th of December, 1890. These were reasonable proposals and both British Columbia and the Dominion governments accepted the terms, so things looked good. 5,000 tons of rail were shipped by the ships Beulah and Longfellow from Britain in May 1874 to Nanaimo and Esquimalt in anticipation of construction of the Esquimalt to Nanaimo Railway per Carnarvon's proposed terms. However, powerful factions in Ottawa remained against the Carnarvon terms. There was continued concern about increase in taxation to pay for the railway. And the Esquimalt to Nanaimo Railway was seen as catering to local rather than national interests. In 1875, a government bill called the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway Bill, which was necessary for construction of the Esquimalt to Nanaimo Railway, passed in the Commons, but failed in the Senate. In the face of this political adversity, the um, Liberal Prime Minister, Alexander Mackenzie abandoned the ENM clause of the Carnarvon terms. And his government issued an, an order in council on September 20th, 1875, which declared that the island railway was not a portion of the main line of the Pacific Railway. A cash subsidy of three quarters of a million dollars was proposed for any delays which might take place in the construction of the Pacific Railway. It was reiterated that there would be no increase of taxation to pay for the Pacific Railway. And it was also stated that British Columbia could build the Esquimalt to Nanaimo Railway using the cash subsidy if they so desired. A period of impasse continued. <clears throat> British Columbia rejected the proposals in the order in council and there was strong secession of sentiment British Columbia potentially separating from the Union. To try and calm the waters, the Governor General, Lord Dufferin, visited British Columbia in August 1876 and assured that the Carnarvon terms would be implemented or a satisfactory equivalent offered. What greeted Carnarvon uh, in Victoria was considerable um, political in, uh, statements regarding an, a want to construct the Esquimalt Nanaimo Railway. This is a picture from 1876 of the railway offices in Victoria dressed up to promote the construction of the Esquimalt to Nanaimo Railway. The impasse continued because despite Dufferin's assurances, Mackenzie would not budge on his terms and he wouldn't uh, adopt a Carnarvon's uh, proposal. Meanwhile, survey work continued on the mainland portion of the Pacific Railway till early 1878. By that time, 11 potential routes for the Canadian Pacific Railway had been recognized, and they're shown on this map. However, of those 11 routes, only two principal routes were really under major consideration. Route six was the Butte Inlet route, ending at the head of uh, Butte Inlet here. And there's the dash continuation of the uh, once proposed continuation of that line down to Esquimalt. And this line, southern line here, through the canyon of the Fraser River, ending up in Burrard Inlet, which was called Route 2. Interestingly enough, this is what we ended up with. A bit of a mixture. We ended up with the Esquimalt Nanaimo Railway here on Vancouver Island and the, a, a, a different uh, pathway for the P Canadian Pacific Railway, which did come down the canyon of the Fraser River and ended up in Burrard Inlet. May 23rd, 1878, a liberal order in council rescinded 
the 1873 Conservative Ordering Council, which had fixed Esquimalt as the Western terminus of the Pacific Railway. You may remember that it was that Conservative Ordering Council in 1873, which uh, prompted um, Marcus Smith to fix the terminus or first survey the terminus of Esquimalt. On May 29, 1878, British Columbia was informed that Burrard Inlet would in all probability be adopted as the Western terminus and that the line would follow the valley of the Fraser River. That's the route two that we just saw on the map. BC wasn't particularly happy. On July 29, 1878, um, BC threatened to withdraw from the Union if construction didn't start by May 1879. This was a little premature, this sort of uh, posturing was a little premature. In August 1878, the rail that had been shipped to Nanaimo and Esquimalt in 1874 was moved to Yale ahead of uh, navigation on the river where construction of the Pacific Railway in BC was planned to start. At this time, there was division within British Columbia. Previously, the, the British, the colony, now uh, province, um, had been united in its threats to secede from the Union. However, once it was assured that a Pacific Railway would be built and that Burrard Inlet would become the Western terminus, British Columbia became divided regarding the threat of separation. The Lower Mainland, seeing that a terminus in Burrard Inlet, was quite happy about that and was ready to reach agreement with the Dominion. However, most of the island and the Caribou District, which were being shut out, were not happy and continuing uh, threats to secede. But without the other half of the province, the secession argument was greatly weakened. John Robson of New Westminster, an MLA and later Premier of British Columbia, stated, <clears throat> Should this turbulent spirit continue in Victoria, I think a quiet intimation that the island might be permitted to drop out and resume the position of a crown colony, the mainland of course remaining to con the Confederacy, would operate as a cure. On the mainland, a very decided opinion against Victoria bluster about separation is growing up. I have reason to believe that a proposition to let the island out and establish the seat of government on the mainland from where it should never have been removed would be regarded very favorably in that section. Don't forget New Westminster was purposefully named New Westminster for a particular reason. It initially was the capital of uh, the southern uh, part of uh, mainland part of, of British Columbia, which was a crown colony separate from Vancouver Island. In 1878, there was a moment of hope for the island with regards to the railway. Macdonald and his conservatives were returned to power. However, Macdonald lost his Kingston seat and had to take up a sacrifice seat given to him by Victoria. This prompted hope on the island that this would help their railway cause. And indeed, in April 22nd, 1879, the Conservative government order in council rescinded the May 23rd, 1878 Liberal government order in council which had rescinded the June 7th, 1873 Conservative Government Ordering Council, which had established as Coimalt as the Western terminus of the Pacific Railway. In other words, according to this uh, Conservative Order in Council in 1879, Esquimalt was reinstated as the terminus of the Pacific Railway. However, by October of the same year, the Conservative Dominion Government ought by order in council finally endorsed the Burrard Inlet route. So a complete about face. So what about the Esquimalt to Nanaimo Railway? That was a subject of ongoing negotiations. 1882 saw various attempts to contract construction of a railway between Esquimalt and Nanaimo. Dunsmuir, uh, had incomplete preliminary negotiations with the Dominion government and the syndicate led by a man called Clements, uh, in fact, an American company, basically looked as if they were going to uh, construct the railway, but in the end, they failed to provide the required financial security. Finally, 
After negotiations with the Dominion government, the British Columbia government passed on May 12, 1883, an act relating to the island railway, the graving dock and railway lands of the province. Some of the principal terms of this act include the following, that British Columbia agrees that the Dominion may contract out construction of a railway between the Nanaimo and Esquimalt through a company to be called the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway Company, and that grants designate and it granted designated railway lands on Vancouver Island to the Dominion to be used for payment for construction of that railway line. On its side, the Dominion government um, undertook that the railway line from Esquimalt to Nanaimo be commenced and completed within three and a half years from the date of passing the act. In other words, completion by November 6, 1886. And the graving dock, which we haven't discussed, um, which was turning out to be a bit of a nightmare for the provincial government, was handed over to the feds and they would continue to finance that uh, white elephant. Shortly after this, Wednesday, October the 8th, 1883, we see the Nanaimo Free Press announcing that Dunsmuir secured the contract for construction of the railway. This is the contract signed by Dunsmuir. We won't read it here, don't worry about that. If it's interesting, you can find it online. And the principal terms of the commitment and payment made by Dunsmuir Dunsmuir committed to construct a four foot eight and a half gauge rail line between Esquimalt and Nanaimo by 10th of June, 1887. And he would receive in payment 2 million acres with mineral rights on Vancouver Island and three quarters of a million dollar cash bonus. Some of this is pretty reminiscent of the Carnarvon terms. The map on the right shows in gray, the area granted to Dunsmuir for, constru for construction of the railway a large swath of land on Southeast Vancouver Island. We see uh, repeated on August 22nd and 23rd in the Daily British Colonist, a small article saying that Dunsmuir has deposited a quarter of a million dollars cash with the Dominion government to fulfill the required corporate surety. And it is believed that railway engineers will proceed to survey the route immediately. Well, it wasn't quite immediate, but it was pretty soon afterwards. This is on September the 5th, 1883. Dunsmuir writes from San Francisco that the survey of the island line will begin at once. He will return to Victoria by the next steamer. And that he has appointed Joseph Hunter, now at Eagle Pass in the mainland, um, that Joseph Hunter has been appointed chief engineer of the island railway line. On September the 27th, 1883, the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway Company was incorporated. And the organization of the company is completed in April, 1884, with Dunsmuir being president. And so to work, 30th of April, 1884, Dunsmuir writes to Joseph Hunter, his uh, chief um, engineer, dear sir, as engineer in chief, you will at once proceed with the location of the line between Esquimalt and Nanaimo in accordance with the agreement entered into between the Dominion government and the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway Company of which company I am president. You will be expected to locate the line with the view to the least expenditure in construction consistent with good work and to carry the work to completion without delay. You'll be responsible for all expenditure in your department, returning proper vouchers duly signed to this office and report to me your progress in the work as often as possible. Yours truly, Robert Dunsmuir. A couple of days later, May the 6th, we see a second first stake. Um, surveyed at Esquimalt. The article, May 6th, 1884, from the Daily British Colonist notes, Division Number 1 of the Island Railway Surveying Corps left the office in Government Street yesterday morning. The first stake will be driven this morning at the spot near the Esquimalt Indian Village, where the ex-missionary played the fantastic trick of driving the first stake of the Island Railway in 1875. 
It's consoling to know that the stake driving on this occasion will be real, not sham. And then it goes to name who was in the party. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, how construction uh, progressed uh, on the ENN. Surveying for the line commenced almost simultaneously at each end. In other words, one uh, party started under C.E. Perry at Esquimalt, and a party under J. Gray started at Nanaimo, and they worked towards each other. On the southern end, C.E. Perry, the contractor, to commence surveying, as we saw, May 6th, 1884. And um, newspaper articles show that uh, they were in the area of Parsons Bridge two days later. July 24th, they were up at the head of uh, the Saanich Inlet. What I couldn't find was date of completion of their contract up at uh, Shawnigan Lake area, but it had to have been around late August, 1884. This is a period photograph purported to be a survey crew working along Arbutus Bluff on the Malahat. However, from what I see, the rail bed is already constructed there. Uh, the work of the initial surveyors is done. So I have my suspicions, even though it's called a survey crew working along Arbutus Bluff in the Malahat, I think it probably isn't. Working from uh, north to south, this is the Jay Gray uh, survey party. They started approximately the 17th of May, 1884 in Nanaimo and worked south. And by the 18th of June, they were, were surveying in the area of the Southfield Mines here. Their first camp was the area of Chase River, south of Nanaimo. They moved camp to the head of Oyster Bay in 18, 18th of June, 1884, and were surveying in that area by July 24th, 1884. Camp was leapfrogged up to Shimanus area the 25th of July, 1884, and the, uh, their side of the surveying contract was completed about 26th of August, 1884. So the surveying had been done. And interestingly enough, um, one, one reference says that the survey, it didn't follow the exact line of survey that had been done by Sanford Fleming in the early 1870s, um, but it probably took that as an initial starting point. Let's look at the actual construction contracts for the ENN. Basically, the main part of the ENN, the core ENN contract was divided into two. There was what, what was, is called the Northern contracts, which stretched from the Nanaimo to Cliffside at Shawnigan Lake, and the Southern contract, which stretched from Esquimalt North to Cliffside. There were two um, extensions uh, to the line, uh, one at Wellington, which was awarded to W.E. Blackett, and another one, uh, Victoria Extension, was awarded to McClellan and Earl. The clearing and grading of the right of way um, <clears throat> in the Northern contract uh, in 1884, September 20th, a company uh, called Graham and Busk was awarded the contract and they kicked it off at Oyster Bay, not at Nanaimo. Work started at Oyster Bay and it, at, on the 1st of October, 1884. And this, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, um, one of their first uh, orders of duty was to construct a wharf in Oyster Bay to facilitate landing of supplies for construction of the railway. It's a bit uncertain. They arrived in Oyster Bay the 1st of October, 1884. Their instructions were to start uh, building a wharf, but what I consider the main wharf, which was the, the wharf um, through which shipping uh, unloaded most of the uh, material for the construction of the railway lines was commenced May 13th, 1885 and completed June 7th, 1885 in Oyster Bay. Interestingly enough, in inferences from the uh, newspaper article indicate that this party here, uh, clearing and grading was predominantly white labor, whereas a slightly later start, January the 12th in the Nanaimo was predominantly Chinese labor. Some of the hiccups in clearing and grading of the Northern contract um, was that uh, Graham and Bust failed 
March 20th, 1885. And a company called Bell, Larkin and Patterson took over. Bell, Larkin, Larkin and Patterson basically uh, had been awarded the contract for um, a bridging and uh, laying rail. So they took over the remnants of the clearing and grading. They had Chinese subcontractors and one of them in August 1st, 1885, a significant Chinese contractor failed. So these were hiccups in the ongoing work. This just uh, a slide to, to throw our minds back to what it was like at the time. Uh, an article from the Nanaimo Daily News, the 1st of October, 1884. And it talks about the contractors um, for the 20 and three quarter mile section of the Island Railway arrived on the grounds of commencement midway between Oyster Harbor and Shimanus. About 30 men came up on the rivet to work and 23 on the steamer Amelia. Now remember, roads were pretty rudimentary on Vancouver Island at this time. And most of the traffic between Victoria and Nanaimo was by paddle steamer. And these were two of the workhorses of the time, the RP Rivet and the SS Amelia. What's interesting, the latter part of the uh, newspaper article says, their first work will be construction of a wharf at the place of commencement. This points significantly to the fact that coal from the new mine, and I think they're referring to the Alexandria mine, will be shipped jointly there and at Departure Bay, Esquimalt being entirely out of the race. So first indications of uh, Oyster Harbor, Oyster Bay, now called Ladysmith Harbor, um, being intended for shipping of coal. So where was this wharf in Oyster Bay? What I show you here is the nautical charts that were available at that time. Uh, a Captain Richards um, of the British Hydrographic Service in 1859 surveyed Oyster Harbor. And this is the, the uh, chart that was published in 1865. And when we look at this chart, a blow up of Oyster Harbor area, Oyster Bay is variably called. Um, what I did was I looked for areas where you had um, near shore deep water, proximity to the path of the proposed uh, ENN railway line and a moderate slope. So you didn't have to um, climb up massive uh, steep um, inclines to get from the wharf to the main line. And what I come to is that uh, it looks like this area here was the best area. You've got six fathoms, very close to an area of moderate slope, close to the line of the ENN railway. There are other suggestions as to why this area may have been the area where the initial wharf was constructed, because uh, other um, newspaper articles suggest proximity to a large trestle in the area. And the only trestle that we, I can figure out um, and discussing with people like John Sharp that existed in the area was the trestle that would have been built over Holland Creek. And when you put that square over a modern map, it shows that the location, the most likely location for the wharf for construction of the ENN was where the later coal wharves were built at Ladysmith. In other words, Transfer Beach today. So I'm suggesting that this, uh, the 1885 construction of wharves in Oyster Bay, now Ladysmith Harbor, was the first indication which led to uh, location of the town of Ladysmith. Why Oyster Bay? I don't have any direct information as to why Dunsmuir would choose Oyster Bay for unloading uh, equipment for construction. Why wouldn't he start it in Nanaimo or Shimanus where there were established harbor facilities? Well, I think that's probably one of the reasons why. The harbor facilities in both areas were established and were already occupied in Nanaimo by coal companies and Shimanus by the uh, Angus and Croft sawmill don't know. This is a period photograph of the right of way of construction and grading of the ENN, probably in the Malahat area. But it gives an idea of the uh, extent of the right of way that was constructed and the initial roadbed that would have been laid down prior to laying the rails. So we've seen the surveying and we've seen uh, the right of way. Um, what about equipment delivery? 
Well, we saw the wharf at Oyster Bay was completed June 7th, 1885. This is a list of shipping that I could find in the newspaper articles, which came to Oyster Bay to unload uh, railway equipment. June 5th, 1885, in other words, while they were still finishing construction of the wharf, a ship called the Cambrian Prince delivered a load of rail and fish plates, etc. This was followed shortly after by the Barnard Castle, which delivered 1,500 tons of rail to Oyster Bay. July 26th, 1885 was a very important delivery. The first locomotive was delivered, plus a load of rail. So by the end of uh, July, 4,000 tons of rail had been delivered and a locomotive. I'm sure this isn't a complete list of shipping, but it's what I could find uh, in the newspaper articles. October the 24th, a ship called the Queen City delivered a steam shovel and flat cars. The Fanny Tucker in November, more rail, and the Wellington again in February 1886, another locomotive and flat cars. So a lot of activity on this wharf. So some of these ships, this is the Barnard Castle, um, the sunken one, there's a, a boat behind it. Those are not the Barnard Castle. This is Barnard Castle rigging here. The ship sank in Pilot Bay in 1886 after hitting a reef. Um, it's actually a well-known dive site in British Columbia now. And this, the SS Wellington, which uh, the coal aficionados in Ladysmith know is the ship that took the first load of coal out from Ladysmith, the harbor, uh, from uh, the extension mines, was a ship that was built to order for Dunsmuir and Diggle in 1883 in Britain. And uh, it, they later sold it and it was renamed the Aesgarth. This is a picture of the ship when it was named the Aesgarth, but as you can see, a fairly substantial ship built for coal transport, but which was used extensively during construction of the ENN railway for transshipment of rail and locomotives up from San Francisco. This is a, a rather interesting uh, account of the arrival of the first locomotive. Um, the article being Saturday, the 25th of July in the Nanaimo Daily News. It talks about a large quantity of rails, fish plates, etc., uh, were landed by the Bernard Castle, as we've seen. The interesting part, um, <clears throat> the steamship Wellington is alongside the wharf and the pioneer locomotive of the Island Railway was safely landed on the track. Captain Young, with coat off saying, come on to his willing officers and men and the machinery available on the steamer combined with the excellent arrangements which had been provided on shore under the personal directions of Mr. Dunsmuir, speedily accomplished without hitch what was by no means an inconsiderable undertaking, the discharge of a ponderous locomotive of 40 tons weight in one place at an out of the way port like Oyster Harbor. Rails are being laid on the siding. It was a half mile siding between the, uh, the wharf and the main line. And soon will be a busy time. This is the locomotive that was unloaded. It was a Shukton 440 weighing 40 tons. This is the, uh, remember I mentioned uh, delivery of a steam shovel. This is it receiving water from uh, a steam engine in Oyster Bay. And you can imagine that a steam shovel was a heck of a lot more efficient in moving ballast than a, a bunch of Chinese with shovels shoveling um, gravel up onto these flat cars where it could be taken to ballast the track. So track laying progress, we saw that there was a huge amount of equipment brought into the Oyster Bay Wharf. And from there, basically track laying proceeded south and north. Of course, they needed people to work the railway and there was a spate of advertisements um, looking for track layers and just people to, uh, to build the track. So looking at the track laying progress, Initial emphasis was on connecting with Shimanus. And I suggest the reason was to access the sawmill supply of lumber 
for trestles, bridges, and ties. We saw that in 1880, uh, July 25th, 1885, Loki number one was unloaded. <clears throat> July 30th, the locomotive was on the siding track. And August 5th, 1885, at Oyster Bay, the first mainline rail was laid. By August the 18th, six miles of track had been completed. And by August the 27th, 1885, Oyster Bay to Shimana's track had been completed. Subsequent progress in uh, track laying was in part dictated by completion of the major bridges. So what we saw was basically that um, they concentrated on this part of the track laying here, got connected to the soil in Shimana's, and we're able to go back up here, lay the track up to the Nanaimo River and complete the Nanaimo River Bridge and move forward once they'd done that with track laying on to Nanaimo itself, which they completed by February the 25th, 1886. Going south, the um, Shimanus River Bridge was completed November 7th, 1885. Um, February the 14th, 1886, they were about one and a half miles south of that at a place called Hole Swamp. The Cowichan River Bridge was completed in June 1886, and track laying on the northern portion of the ENN was completed to Cliffside on July 29th, 1886. Just to look at some of the major bridges, we've already touched on them. Interestingly enough, the Chase River trestle, in other words, a, a significant trestle, which was very close to Nanaimo, was built first. Um, it was receiving a top tier. April 26th, 1885. The other bridges um, were uh, the lumber came from Shimanus, um, and the, the, uh, the trusses were prepped at Shimanus. And as we saw, the Nanaimo River Bridge uh, was completed September 25th, 1885. The Shimanus River Bridge completed November the 7th. And the Cowichan River Bridge, um, it was a Howe Trust as well. Piles were being driven October 1st, 1885. <clears throat> the bridge was incomplete as of May 14th, 1886, and was probably completed late May, early June, 1886, as the whole contract, the track lane contract, was completed July 29th, 1886. Let's have a look at some of these bridges. This is a photograph from um, <clears throat> Don uh, McLaughlin's book, The Dunsmuir Years, Ian Rail Railway. The Dunsmuir years. It's not identified in that um, book as being the Cowich or Shimanus River Bridge, but I suspect it is the Shimanus River Bridge. I could be wrong. And note also the, uh, the loaded ballast cars going across the bridge for track construction. This is the Nanaimo River Bridge in 1886, the Howe Trust Bridge, and the Cowich River Bridge in 1886. This is the uh, Nanaimo Railway Station, the photograph being taken in 1886. Interestingly enough, um, an article in July 1885 refers to lumber being hauled from the Nanaimo sawmill for construction of the station in July 1885. So I suspect this building was completed second half of 1885. And upon uh, completion of the laying of rail to Nanaimo, a roundhouse and turntable were completed there in May 1886. So let's move to the southern part of the ENN. This was a different a ball game, a different set of challenges which required a different approach to construction, less sequential. The Malapat, of course, was the major obstacle. Down here um, is uh, the elevation profile. Here is Esquimalt, which was the terminus. As you go north, you gradually um, gain elevation until you reach Goldstream area, which is the start of the Malahat, and you go up, up the Malahat, up over the summer, and then back down towards Cliffside. In February 20th, 1885, uh, the construction contract for the line was awarded to A.J. McClellan. There was an interesting subcontract to a man called J.S. Antonelli, uh, which basically covered the uh, ascending area of the, the Malahat, because that involved a lot of heavy rock work and significant bridging. Interestingly, the bridge and trestle lumber 
came from Croft and Angus Shemana Saw Sawmill. It was towed down and brought up to Esquimalt Harbor and unloaded at Parsons Bridge. Um, <clears throat> as you'll see from some photographs coming up, there was a hell of a lot of lumber involved. Line construction started March 5th, 1885. There was an apparent division of labor. Whites were building trestles and Chinese doing grading. A significant number of people were at work. The McClellan contract had over a thousand workers and Antonelli had at least 350, of which 100 were white and 250 Chinese. After initiation of construction on March 5th, 1885, um, in May, uh, work was all going all on all along the route uh, between Esquimalt and Goldstream. And by mid-June 1885, most of the trestle work, which was considerable in this area, had been completed. On the Antonelli contract, which started on the northern side of the Goldstream uh, River, one mile of grade had been completed by May 19, 1885. Unfortunately, I don't have any information. I haven't found information yet on the timing of grading up through here in the northern part. As we looked uh, in Oyster Bay, shipping of materials, um, I must say that uh, what I found must be extremely incomplete. The first ship to bring material um, to Esquimalt after completion of the wharf June 5th uh, sorry, the wharf construction commenced June 5th, 1885, and probably took about a month because the Nagpur came in in July, 1885, with a cargo of rail and fish plates. Wellington followed quickly soon after with uh, a locomotive, the Victoria, and a large number of flat cars. As I say, quite a lot of shipping must be missing. The last one I have is Wellington again, September the 11th, 1886, when it brings two first-class passenger cars and two combined smoking baggage cars to the wharf at uh, Esquimalt. So track lane, it commenced about late July, 1885. In December, 1885, there was a train excursion that ran from Esquimalt up to Goldstream. The Goldstream trestle itself was under construction imminently uh, to be completed um, by Christmas Day, 1885. In April, 1886, uh, an excursion train from Esquimalt went as far as the double-headed ravine where construction was to be completed five days later, April 6th. Oops. There were some significant obstacle, obstacles to be overcome ahead of the line. Um, the Niagara Canyon, which you'll see for some photographs, was a formidable um, obstacle. And uh, there was what they called the Big Blast, which was set off in March 1886. And I've seen varying reports of the amount of giant black powder used to uh, make the, uh, the foundations for this, the trestle over the Niagara Canyon. One article said that two and a half thousand pounds of giant powder were set off at one point, at one time, to basically blow half the mountainside down. Another article, which sounds incredible, actually said it was seven and a half tons of powder that set off in one explosion. Um, take your pick. Trestle construction over the Niagara Canyon started on the 6th of May, 1886, and it took about two months to build. And when you see the photographs, that's quite remarkable. I haven't found any information with regards to construction of two other obstacles, um, the, uh, the trestle over the Arbutus Creek Canyon and the tunnel. There's a report um, late July, early August, 1886, during the last 10 days of construction on the contract, McClellan crews laid eight miles of tracks using 20,000 ties and in part constructing 10 tress trestles. So an amazing pace of construction once they got over the hump uh, of, the of the Malahat. By August 10th, 1886, track laying to cliffside had been completed. And this was followed August 13th, 1886 by Sir John A. MacDonald 
driving in the last spike. Let's just look at the southern portion, some photographs of what they were building in the southern portion of the ENN. And what I'm going to use as a base map is an 1880 map of Southeast Vancouver Island, upon which the trace of route of the ENN Southern contract is, is, is uh, shown. It's very difficult to see here. It's a very light red line, but it'll be more obvious on this one here. You can see this line. That's the line of the actual railway. These are significant features on the Southern contract. Um, the first stake, which we saw was initially put in in 1875, then reiterated um, uh, at the beginning of construction of the real, real construction of the ENN. Dunsmuir is cut and a whole pile of trestles and bridges over the lowland area at the head of the Esquimalt Harbor. Then we'll look at the various bridges over War Creek, Goldstream, Double-Headed Ravine, Niagara Creek, Arbutus Creek, and the tunnel. So let's just sit back and enjoy ourselves and see what the lads were up to. This is Dunsmuir's Cut, just uh, inland of the wharf at Esquimalt Harbor. And here is Dead Man's River Bridge. You can see a trestle bridge over uh, skirting the edge of the Dead Man River. The bridges were popular as they used for fishing by people. This is the trellis, uh, trestle over Price's Field, quite a significant trestle, as you can see. And as I said before, the lumber came from uh, Angus and Croft uh, sawmills in Shimanus. Here's a 1,600-foot trestle. Another view uh, from Parsons Bridge of the trestle. And now we're, we're approaching the, the base of the Malahat. This is the first significant bridge which spanned War Creek. And this is the one over Goldstream. And I think this picture was taken on March 31st, 1886 in association with one of the railway um, uh, excursions that uh, Dunsmuir used to show various dignitaries what was going on on the line. This photograph I'm pretty sure definitely was taken on March 31st, 1886. It's at the, the head of constructed line at the double-headed ravine. And you can see that the, uh, the train here with two flat cars loaded with dignitaries. This is the double-headed ravine during construction in 1886. Some temporary tracks for the contractor's horse-drawn carts in the Malahat area. And I'm just gonna show you a picture of what it looks like today, the same rock cut today. I got this off YouTube. Now we move on to the Niagara Canyon trestle, which was a truly formidable construction. As I said, construction started 6th of May, 1886. It was erected in two months, consumed 400,000 board feet of lumber, and the height of the trestle was 235 feet from base to rail bed. This is a picture of uh, a train going over the Niagara Canyon trestle. Trestles inherently were um, vulnerable to um, flash floods, et cetera. This is the Niagara Canyon trestle, which was washed out in 1896. The original trestle, as I mentioned, took two, two months to build. Uh, reconstruction in 1896 took six weeks and was done by the same, the initial contractor. This trestle, as pretty well all the other um, trestles, were, was subsequently replaced. This one was replaced with a steel bridge in 1912. This is the trestle over Arbutus Creek Canyon. At least I'm 98% sure it is. It's, I think it's misidentified mis, uh, in uh, McLaughlin's book. I could be wrong. McLaughlin knew a hell of a lot more about ENI and the, than I did, but I'm pretty sure it's not the double-headed ravine trestle. I think it's the, uh, the Arbutus Creek Canyon trestle. Here we are up at the one tunnel on the railway, 190 feet long, a view from outside and from inside. And this is the northern end of the tunnel. And then as we saw, 
10 a.m. August 13th, 1886, John A. McDonald drove the last spike at Cliffside on the east side of Shawnigan Lake at mile 25. It's said to have been done with a silver hammer and a gold spike. I have to say they will have to have drilled a hole into the tie to get a gold spike into it. This is the commemorative cairn marking the spot at Cliffside. So once the last spike had been uh, set, September 8, 1886, there was a special return train for ENN dignitaries and contractor CEOs, uh, which left Esquimalt, went to Nanaimo, spent about 20 minutes in Nanaimo, and then returned to Esquimalt. September 13, 1886, there was a special train put on for Dominion representatives so they could inspect the line and basically see that it was okay for them to release the capital that uh, the $750,000 that um, was being withheld by the Dominion. September 23rd, 1886, there was a special four car excursion train. And on September 30th, 1886, the first revenue run. Once construction was completed, um, there was a wholesale sell off of equipment and the newspapers are full of advertisements uh, telling people about uh, um, auctions, et cetera, et cetera. So the ENN railway, I think you've seen from the photographs, it was actually quite a remarkable feat. August 20th, 1883, the contract was signed, surveying commenced 1884, and the first passenger revenue run from Russell's uh, in Victoria West to Nanaimo, September 30th, 1886. It was a massive supply chain effort. Engineering, manpower, supplies, rail, fish plates, etc., rolling stock, tools, blasting powder, about 200,000 ties, uh, lumber, food, etc. I didn't see any obvious delays due to supply chain shortages. There may have been some, but it's not obvious. So, what were the other threats to construction progress? Work safety. There were a heck of a lot of blasting accidents. Here's one, which is quite interesting. Um, April 26th, 1885, on the Daily British Colonist, Mr. R. Evans left by the steamer Empire on Thursday for San Francisco to procure an artificial hand to take the place of the natural hand recently blown off by giant powder. There's a string of other accidents. A few days since Hubbard was working with a gang of men blasting rock when the fragments of one blast, through some unknown cause, scattered further than usual, and a large piece of rock struck him on the left arm near the elbow, completely shattering it. The same article refers to a Thomas Foran who had his arm shattered by a blast on the railway. So quite a lot of uh, collateral damage while the railway was being built. Cavins, a man here, at Jackson's camp, where I, I have to figure out where that was, received severe injuries by caving in on a bank of a bank under which he was working. There was also livestock collisions with the trains going up and down, cattle weren't used to it, the line wasn't fenced off and guess what happened? Health issues. Early on in February uh, in 1885, there was uh, a case of smallpox among the workmen on the railway at Camp 10. I have to figure out where Camp 10 was, but this apparently did not lead to major complications, luckily. And some rather poignant uh, situations. This man, I think his name is probably Ed Gallagher, a native of Donegal, died at the Nanaimo Hospital. Um, he was working on the railway and became somewhat demented. In this state, he wandered into the woods and was nearly starved to death when found. So tragedy. Also, it was a bit of the Wild West. There was a major robbery uh, where $10,500 of the payroll was robbed. Um, this was uh, Bell, Larkin, and Patterson contractors' payroll. The paymaster was robbed on, ju um, in early, on July 18th. And um, by December 4th of the same year, the Mounties got their man because Francis Oliver Adair was charged with stealing the money and pled guilty. I don't know what he got as a sentence. 
There were also murders, serious trouble on the island railway near Oyster Bay, three Chinamen reported killed. Fire and flood, serious fires on Chimanus River. Near Oyster Harbor, the area covered by fire extends two miles and strenuous efforts are being made to save the railway bridge timbers and ties from destruction. An incident recorded um, by Turner in his book, Vancouver Island Railroads, refers to a storm. <clears throat> Bents for a thousand foot bridge were being assembled on the beach at Oyster Harbor when strong winds coupled with a particularly high tide carried the whole assembly out to, tea, out to sea. 100,000 feet of timber was lost. Well, let's look at the time card. Here it is, the very first time card for the E and N, September 30th, 1886. Left Russell's in Victoria West, 8 a.m. Arrived Nanaimo, 11.40. Left Nanaimo at 2 p.m. Returned to Russell's at 5.40 p.m. Note in here, Duncan Somanos Shemanus Nanaimo. No Ladysmith, and that's because Ladysmith didn't exist. So let's look at the extensions. The Northern Extension, Nanaimo to Wellington, September the 5th, 1886, W.E. Blackett secured the contract for construction. And by October the 11th, a large force of white and Chinamen were scattered along the route with quite a lot of grading already done. The big um, <clears throat> obstacle going north from Nanaimo was the Millstone River. In October the 22nd, 1886, a coffer dam was in place for construction of the foundation of the bridge. And that bridge was completed by January the 1st, 1887. Track laying for the Northern Extension uh, commenced March the 24th, 1887, with uh, one mile being completed in short order. By April 30th, 1887, track laying was completed to Wellington, but balance, ballasting was ongoing. And coal was moving by May 4th, 1887 from Wellington down to Victoria. June 1st, official passenger service from Wellington commenced. And uh, ballasting uh, was nearing completion and the Wellington station construction was also nearing completion July 27th, 1887. So basically from letting of the contract, September 15th, 1886, the whole thing was done by the end of July, 1887. This is the old uh, Millstream Bridge, a Howe Trust bridge over the Millstream River, uh, north of Nanaimo. This is another view. There's the bridge in the background. This is the, uh, <clears throat> the sawmill, which provided the lumber for the Nanaimo uh, station building. The southern extension between Esquimalt and Victoria. Um, <clears throat> it was built in two stages. Surveying commenced July 5th, 1885, with the terminus as of yet undecided. On July 12th, the construction contract was awarded to McClellan. You may remember the name McClellan from the southern part of the ENN construction, and Earl. The terminal was to be on the Songhees Indian Reserve. Again, another Indian reserve affected by the railway. And there was to be a ferry to cross down, cross to downtown Victoria. Um, that didn't last long. Uh, people realized, look, we want a bridge connection across to Victoria from Russell's. So engineering plans for a swing bridge were awaiting Ottawa approval in July, 1887. Yeah. Sorry, 1886, that should be. August 3rd, 1886, grading was completed. Track laying uh, was commenced and anticipated that trains would be in Russell's by uh, October. September 30th, 1886, Russell, uh, regular train service from Russell Station, Victoria West to Nanaimo. The actual bridging to downtown Victoria, I don't know when the actual bridge construction commenced, probably late 1887, but it was uh, the draw on the bridge, in other words, the swing part, had completed construction by February 7th, 1888, and by March 29th, 1888, first train to downtown Victoria 
of the new swing bridge trundled in. This is a photograph showing the uh, swing bridge under construction in Victoria Harbor. And the arrival of the first train to downtown Victoria, March 29, 1888. So that's, uh, I probably flattened you with all that information. <clears throat> um, the epilogue is, all wooden trestles and bridges were subsequently replaced with steel structures and or infilling. Locally, the course of the track was changed. An example is the loop between Goldstream and the double-headed canyon. And of course, there were subsequent extensions of the ENN to Fort Alberni, Comox, et cetera. But the ENN railway really was an engineering feat and a construction marvel, which reflected the incredible energy of colonial expansion in North America in the latter part of the 19th century. Its legacy today is a right away and set of tracks, the future of which is yet to be decided, and also a difficult land situation. These are just some of the key references that I used. A very interesting um, thesis uh, written in 1936 by a man called Arthur Johnson, which chronicles uh, the trial travails of getting the Canadian Pacific Railway built. Also, um, John McLaughlin's uh, book, The Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway, The Dunsmuir Years, was an invaluable reference. As uh, you've seen, I um, spent a lot of time trolling contemporary newspapers for relevant articles and uh, indications of progress of construction along the line. And Daniel Marshall wrote a series of articles in the Orca called The Battle of the Roots. And that's basically it. I hope you're still alive.